All right, so in the last lecture, we talked about the apicomplexins, which are a protease that sits underneath the alveolata group based upon that key feature. Um, remember, so remember, they all, all members of alveolata have that apex, that point in that alveoli. That's the key feature. The apicomplexin, they just use theirs, again, to penetrate into the host. So this brings us to our third group of alveolata. These are the ciliates. Now, ciliates have a large diversity of ecological roles. Um, a lot of them out there in different aqu aquatic environments, freshwater, saltwater. Uh, but kind of the defining features that we're going to see with these guys are large numbers of cilia that they use for movement. Now cilia look like tiny little hairs all across their entire body. They use this to sweep and propel and kind of push themselves around incredibly fast. So imagine having a boat with 10,000 little oars sticking out the sides. How quick you can go if all those are are sweeping and pushing and uh, beating simultaneously, very, very rapid movement. They do have the pellicle, that tough but flexible outer covering. So it's similar to the euglenid, but these guys again are classified at this point under alveolata because of the alveoli. There's going to be two types of nuclei within the ciliates. So we'll have a large nuclei and a small nuclei. And I'll show you a picture of those in a moment here. And then the last major feature oops, is that ciliates have bunches and bunches of vacuoles within their body. <clears throat> so these guys are all excuse me, they're all single celled organisms. But when we look internally, pretty complex. I mean, lots of different structural adaptations and features that have made them successful. So here's our general body plan. So they have anterior, posterior end. They're going to have bags or vacuoles there called contractile vacuoles. These vacuoles will be used to regulate water. So water can come in, the vacuole can swell, it can expel water, can help regulate internal conditions. So that way, if the external conditions of the cilia, ciliate, or in this case, a paramecium, changes, they can regulate internal conditions to a certain extent. So I want you guys to think about osmosis movement of water through membranes to maintain ideally an isotonic environment that's what those vacuoles are going to do for them is to try to maintain an isotonic environment inside to match the environment outside the aquatic environment obviously if the environment outside gets too extreme these guys can't survive but they do have some ability to regulate that environment with the vacuoles the opening here, the little groove on the side here, goes into the gullet. So when they move around and they find food and they, they slide up next to the food, <clears throat> it slips down into the gullet, comes down here, and then gets formed or put into a vacuole, a food vacuole. That moves into the body of the organism, floats around, digestive enzymes break down whatever the paramecium has eaten, nutrients diffuse throughout the organism, waste product then goes to the cell membrane and gets expelled and exocytosis, if that term sounds familiar, basically spit out of the cell. Uh, the macro and micronuclei, two nuclei, they're going to have different purposes here. So let me get down to here and show you what's going on with the macro and micronuclei. So each paramecium or ciliate will have two nuclei. 
So what they're going to do is they're going to actually exchange nuclei. They're going to exchange the micronuclei during, let's put the air quotes around it, sexual reproduction. Not truly sexual. No boys and girls. Just two individuals. But they can exchange that micronuclei and swap genetic material that way. The macronuclei mostly functions for, or contains the information for basic function, metabolism, environmental regulation, things like that with the macronuclei. It's the DNA that contains the genetics that will be found in the micronuclei. So when they go into this process known as conjugation and they're swapping micronuclei, they create new genetic variation. So imagine the person that you see at the grocery store, you decide to swap a chunk of DNA. Now you carry their trait, they carry a trait of yours. You are no longer your original genetic code because you've just inherited new information. These guys then do have the ability to simply copy themselves, asexual reproduction. So you grabbed a piece of DNA from the person in the grocery store, now your hair color is different, and then you go and divide and clone yourself. Now there's two of you, you're different than the original you. So these guys can constantly change and adapt and over long periods of time, evolve to survive and be found in a large diversity of aquatic environments. So heterotropic, there's no photosynthesis happening here. They will have mitochondria, they will have digestive enzymes, all the things they need to be a heterotropic organism. Okay, so that takes care of the alveolata within the supergroup chromial alveolata. So what I wanna do here is, let's do a review slide. I'm gonna embed these throughout the lecture here. Same encouragement as the previous one. Write this out. Don't just copy the slide or print it. Write it out. Take a piece of paper, write out chromio alveolata. What is the key feature that places you right here? So to be in this super group, what do you need? Then, depending upon a feature, you can go down to alveolata <clears throat> or you can go down to stramina pilla. Now, we haven't gotten here yet. We'll get there. But what is the key feature to be alveolata or features? Now, once you have those features, so that's step two to place here. <clears throat> so we could say 2A puts you in alveolata. If you have features 2B, then you go stramina pilla. Again, we'll get there. If you have 2A features, the alveolata features, then you can drop down to dinoflagellata, apicomplexans, or sneak this over here, the ciliates, based upon those characteristics we talked about for these guys. So this would basically be, let's call it step three. A would be dinoflagellata, 3B would be apicomplexans, 3C would be ciliates. Once we get through 2B, which we'll do in the next lecture, then, let me get to the then you would drop over here to, we would say, 4A or 4B, etc. So again, I can, can't stress enough, approach this like the dichotomous key in the taxonomy lab that you guys already did. Okay, So it's the easiest way to say, oh, can I actually write out this content like a dichotomous key. Build it out that way, and it'll make it much easier to understand how to work through this content, how to keep it organized. The biggest challenge of protists is organizing them because there's so many different things going on in this particular lecture and this particular group. <clears throat> so, okay. So I'm going to cut the PowerPoint here because I don't want this to be a gigantic file within Blackboard that you can't download. So I'm going to cut the PowerPoint here and then I want you to go to the next Protease PowerPoint for the remainder of the lecture. So that way it's all the same, <clears throat> it's all connected. It's just simply 
reducing file size in Blackboard to make it easier for you guys to download. Okay, so you're done with this chunk. Go back into Blackboard, go to the next Protease PowerPoint, download that one, and then <clears throat> on that one, we'll pick up with Stramino Pillow. All right, I'll see you in the next lecture.